Apologies from the Prime Minister as he says he shares the anger of people after a video emerges of Downing Street staff joking about holding a Christmas gathering last year amidst COVID restrictions. This fictional party was a business meeting. <laughs> and it was not socially distanced. Have you lied to the public, Prime Minister? Tough questions for the Prime Minister over that video. He says he's sickened by it and has been reassured that no rules were broken. I can understand how infuriating it must be to think that the people who have been setting the rules have not been following the rules, Mr Speaker, because I was also furious to see that clip. Millions of people now think the Prime Minister was taking them for fools and that they were lied to. We'll have all the reaction to Prime Minister's questions as Whitehall sources tell the BBC an announcement on tighter coronavirus restrictions could be imminent. Also this lunchtime. Anyone over 40 in England can now book their coronavirus booster jab as the rollout for top-ups continues. It comes on the anniversary of the first COVID vaccine being given outside a trial. Nearly 120 million jabs have been received in the UK and 8 billion across the world. The new face of Germany, Olaf Scholz, is sworn in as Chancellor as Angela Merkel bows out after 16 years in office. A woeful England, a bowled out for just 147 on day one of the Ashes series. And coming up in sport on the BBC News channel, Mercedes ends its heavily criticised Formula One sponsorship deal with Kingspan, a company linked to the cladding on the Grenfell Tower. Good afternoon and welcome to the BBC News at One. The Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, has apologised for a video obtained by ITV News showing his staff joking about a Christmas party last year at Number 10 Downing Street in the middle of a strict coronavirus lockdown. It follows a week of denials from the government that such a party had ever taken place. At the event, guests are reported to have enjoyed cheese and wine and taken part in a secret Santa being held when London had moved into Tier 3 restrictions that meant indoor social gatherings were banned. Only six people could meet in outdoor public spaces and the government guidance specifically stated no work Christmas lunch or parties. Number 10 has insisted that no party took place and all rules were followed. It comes as Whitehall sources tell the BBC an announcement on tighter coronavirus restrictions could be imminent. Our political correspondent Damien Grammaticus reports. Cabinet ministers this morning. Foreign Secretary, is it one rule for Downing Street and another for the rest of the country? Morning, sir. Morning. Is the Why you turn media round? Questions but no answers. Were you at the party, sir? Today in Downing Street, they were deciding if new COVID restrictions will be imposed. Anybody have any questions today? But it's the video of what happened here last year that's caused a crisis. I've Ed. just seen reports from Twitter that there was a Downing Street Christmas party on Friday night. Do you recognise those reports? <laughs> I went home. <laughs> <laughs> hold on, hold on. Laughter about something which for most isn't a laughing matter. What's the answer? I don't know. I didn't What's the party? party? It was cheese and wine. Just be clear, it's not. <laughs> is cheese and wine all right? No. It was a business meeting. <laughs> and we know there was a Christmas party. And it was not socially distanced. <laughs> The video is so damaging for Boris Johnson because for a week he's defended those in it just as he defended Matt Hancock and Dominic Cummings and it's left him exposed. Members of the public who followed the rules at the time, furious. His MPs too. His ability to get people to follow new restrictions undermined. Have you lied to the public, Prime Minister? So a Prime Minister facing questions at every turn. But he didn't even wait for one before making a statement. And I can understand how infuriating it must be to think that the people who have been setting the rules have not been following the rules, Mr Speaker, because I was also furious to see that clip. And Mr Speaker, I apologise, I apologise unreservedly for the offence that it has caused up and down the country and I apologise for the impression that it gives. 
He announced an internal investigation, but said he'd been assured there was no party. We've all watched the video of the Prime Minister's staff, including his personal spokesperson. They knew there was a party. They knew it was against the rules. They knew they couldn't admit it. And they thought it was funny. It's obvious what happened. Anton Decker ahead of the Prime Minister on this. <laughs> because, Mr Speaker, I've been repeatedly assured that no rules were broken. Her Majesty the Queen sat alone when she marked the passing of the man she'd been married to for 73 years. Leadership. Sacrifice. That's what gives leaders the moral authority to lead. Does the Prime Minister think he has the moral authority to lead and to ask the British people to stick to the rules? Not, not only that, Mr Speaker, but uh, they, the Labour Party and the, the, the Labour leader in particular have played politics, have played politics, Mr Speaker, throughout, throughout this pandemic. There was even a call for the Prime Minister to go. The only right and moral choice left to him, it is for his resignation. Yeah. When can we expect it? Hi, Minister. Mr Speaker, I'm, uh, the party opposite and indeed the other party opposite are going to continue to play politics. I am going to get on with the job. Damien Grammaticus, BBC News, Westminster. Well, the emergence of the mock press conference video last night followed days of questions about the event that took place in Downing Street last December. Our correspondent Tim Muffet has been looking at the reaction to the leaked footage. Political stories sometimes slip by unnoticed. What about this one? The government has set out guideline rules and a lockdown for them to then go have a Christmas party. When questioned about it, business meeting, she's stuttering, this is the Prime Minister's spokesperson that's talking. Me, I work in constructions, I go through problems on a daily basis where I have to follow these guideline rules and these lot are in Downing Street having a whale of a time. I'm not very interested in it actually, I just want to get on with my life. I'm not really interested in what happened a year ago. I think it's a bad example of the government but you know they won't be, those people, they're humans, they won't be alone. Many of today's front pages make for pretty awkward reading for the government, and amongst some who lost loved ones, there is barely concealed fury. Sarah lost her mother and brother to COVID. Uh, seeing this video um, is just utterly, utterly sickening, um, and it makes me feel so angry and upset, over and above the upset that we've already, already gone through. We and many, many thousands of families across, across the country, it's just despicable and unforgivable. And by the time Allegra Stratton stood at that podium and laughed her way through that, my dad had the CPAP mask put onto his face and um, the following five days, um, he deteriorated and died on the 28th of December. As well as anger, there's also been mockery of the government's response. But they weren't celebrating. No. They didn't have a party. They categorically deny any suggestions that they had a party. And this fictional party definitely didn't involve cheese and wine <laughs> or a secret Santa. Evening, Prime Minister. Yay! For now. With ongoing concern about the Omicron variant, there is the possibility we could face more COVID restrictions over the coming weeks and months. The big question is whether frustration about this story could affect people's willingness to obey any new rules. I think it's disgusting. Uh, I, I cannot believe that the, uh, the government is expecting people to follow rules that it's uh, it's not willing to uh, follow itself. Do you think there's any danger that people won't follow rules if new rules are brought I in? I thought not. I think people just uh, do what they think is best for themselves. Was it technically a party in Downing Street or not? Either way, it's left the government with an almighty hangover. Tim Muffet, BBC News. Well, our political correspondent Jonathan Blake is in Parliament. There's been no let up on the pressure on the Prime Minister today, Jonathan about this Christmas party. 
No, and there was huge anticipation and expectation about what the Prime Minister would have to say at Prime Minister's questions this lunchtime as many Conservative MPs, exasperated and infuriated at these latest revelations, sat pretty silently and glum-faced behind him. I think the Prime Minister was really left with little choice but to say something beyond what he has done already, which is to dismiss in a pretty cursory manner any questions about that party that did or didn't take place in Down Street uh, before Christmas last year. So we had a change of tone and a change of tack. He said he understood the indignation that people felt seeing that footage. He shared the anger as well. And he announced, of course, that investigation by the Cabinet Secretary into exactly what had happened and said that disciplinary action would follow if necessary. But he did again say that he was assured and is still assured that no rules were broken and there was no party. So he will hope that that investigation contains the controversy for now, that it gives himself and ministers an answer when they face repeated questions on this. Uh, and we are told that that investigation uh, will be reporting as quickly as possible. There'll be huge pressure to make the findings public. And I would expect in the meantime, time uh, that Sir Keir Starmer, the Labour Party and others will keep on the pressure uh, on the Prime Minister over this, as you heard Keir Starmer today accusing Boris Johnson of taking the public for fools. Just very briefly, Jonathan, there are suggestions that um, Covid restrictions could be strengthened again. Yes, we are expecting an announcement uh, possibly as soon as uh, this afternoon or this evening, a cabinet meeting later on, uh, chaired of course by the Prime Minister, to sign off on further restrictions possibly being imposed. If you look at the government's options, Plan B involves more face masks in other settings, working from home, possibly uh, Covid passports being used as well. One Tory MP accusing the Prime Minister openly today of this as a diversionary tactic. Jonathan, thank you very much. Jonathan Blake. The COVID booster programme in England has been expanded again. Anyone in their 40s can now book their third jab three months after their second dose. The announcement comes exactly a year after Margaret Keenan, a 90-year-old grandmother, became the first person in the world to be given a coronavirus vaccine outside a clinical trial. Our health correspondent Catherine Burns reports from Coventry. A warning, her report contains flashing images. This is how the biggest vaccine rollout in history started exactly a year ago. Maggie Keenan getting her first and a world first jab from matron May Parsons. And now back together where it all began, although the two of them have built up a genuine friendship over the year. We are now a tandem. We are now called Maggie May. <laughs> I'm so happy and I, I'm so happy I got the jab and um, it's been a wonderful year really. Maggie was number one of many, over 8 billion jabs around the world. In the UK, more than 118 million doses have been given and almost 21 million people are on their third or booster jab. We've all got used to sites like this over the last 12 months. People turning up, rolling up their sleeves and getting their jab. Now that time, one in every 70 COVID cases ended in death. That has now fallen to one in every 290. We are testing more, but still it gives you a sense of what a real game changer vaccines have been. In the January peak, they had about 270 COVID patients here. That's now fallen to around 35. Most of them have not had their vaccine. The patients that we were getting in my COVID wards are mainly the ones that are really, really poorly, with no medical histories, are young and fit and unvaccinated. And we've also had a lot of uh, pregnant women that's come into my wards that's come really poorly um, because they are also unvaccinated. We're in a constant race, our vaccines against the virus. And now we're up against a new hurdle, the Omicron variant. We are almost certain that it's going to be more transmissible, so it spreads more easily. But it's still early yet to know uh, whether it will, uh, the vaccines will be impacted and to know whether it has any difference in terms of the severity of illness it causes. Uh, but what's really important is that even if there is a drop-off uh, in, in the way the vaccines work, the way that could be countered is by getting the booster dose. From today, almost 7 million over 40s in England will be able to bring their jabs forward to three months. But there are warnings too that extra measures like working from home could be brought in. Catherine joins us now from Coventry. We're in a very different place from where we were a year ago. To what extent, Catherine, have vaccines changed the course of the pandemic? 
Yeah, Martine, here we are in the exact same hospital where it began a year ago. You know, I was there that day and I remember reporting on it and it felt like a really momentous occasion after such a grim year. You know, that day after Maggie came a steady stream all day of elderly people coming to get their protection, many of them dressed up in their Sunday best. Here we are now, just a few hundred metres away, in the same hospital. We're in the vaccination clinic. Essentially, it's a porter cabin in the car park. But the operation here is very smooth. All day, people have been turning up, getting their jabs, having a few minutes rest, and then going off about their day. In terms of the pandemic, though, we're in a really different place now. Before vaccines, the only immunity people had was if they'd been infected. Now, almost 90% of people who can have a vaccine have turned up for their first dose. And if you want one statistic on the real world impact of that, how's this? We're now seeing four times fewer COVID deaths for every case compared to the time before vaccines. And emerging evidence that the vaccines are offering greater protection. Yeah, so with the Omicron variant, any new variant really, I think it's like a jigsaw piece. You throw the puzzles in the air and then slowly you piece out what the reality is. And we're getting new information today. So we've heard from Pfizer and BioNTech about how well or not they think the vaccines will work against this variant. To some extent, this is to be expected. They're saying with two doses, they are seeing a big dip in how effectively it fights it. But there's really good news too, because with three doses, they think those protection levels are rising straight back up. And this all echoes other evidence that we're hearing from South Africa too. Really, it all points in one direction. If you can get your booster dose, do get your booster dose. Catherine, thank you very much. Catherine Burns. A former city regulator, Lord Tyree, has described the market for COVID PCR tests as a rip-off jungle and warned that poor service was still widespread. The government says it monitors complaints and takes swift action when needed. Travellers say the official website has been advertising tests at prices which have been difficult to obtain. After 16 years in power, Angela Merkel has been replaced as Germany's Chancellor. Mrs Merkel has been credited with raising Germany's profile and influence and being a role model for women in politics. Her successor, Social Democrat Olaf Scholz, has served as Vice Chancellor and Finance Minister since March 2018. Our Berlin correspondent Damien McGuinness reports. Frau Dr. Angela Merkel. After 16 years in office, Angela Merkel is no longer Germany's leader. She's the first chancellor in modern Germany to voluntarily give up power. It's the end of one era, the beginning of another. Calm, fact-driven, seemingly unflappable. Nehmen Sie die Wahl an. Germany's new chancellor, Olaf Scholz, is similar in style to Angela Merkel. But unlike Mrs Merkel, he's not a conservative. For the first time in more than a decade and a half, Germany is getting a left-wing chancellor. He says he will bring in a fairer society, a higher minimum wage, a lower voting age and more rights for minorities. Angela Merkel has cleared out her desk in the Chancellor's office already for the new Chancellor, Olaf Scholz, to move in. But there's little time for him to celebrate. Germany is facing huge challenges, most importantly among them, the pandemic. It's being described here as a national crisis. Germany is seeing record high infection rates. Restrictions mean that unvaccinated people are now excluded from most leisure activities and they have to get a daily test to go to work or use public transport. Next year, Germany could also introduce what politicians said would never happen, a compulsory Covid vaccine. There are fears this could spark further protests and divide society. There are also difficult foreign policy questions, including how to deal with Russia and China. Germany's new leaders say this is a fresh start to modernise the country. Given the tough challenges ahead, they need to hang on to that optimism. Damien joins us now from the German capital. What style of leadership can people expect, Damien? 
Well, I think superficially, Martin, very similar to Angela Merkel. So he's seen as having a similar sort of personality. He's a very good deal maker behind the scenes. Olaf Scholz is very experienced. He's used to bringing different parties together, which is going to need that experience, given he's got, got quite an unusual three-way coalition that he has to manage. Uh, he's also a centrist, very much like Angela Merkel. So in a lot of ways, he follows on from her. One of the reasons why he is popular and why he won the election is because Angela Merkel was so popular and German voters have appreciated her calm style especially given the amount of crises that we've seen throughout her 16 years in power and of course going forward Germany is also facing a lot of crisis notably also the pandemic right now so that appeals to voters but of course they're from very different parties what uh, Olaf Scholz promises is quite a left-wing agenda so he really says he wants to fight social injustice and help people who are at the bottom of the scale when it comes to poverty uh, he's also leading a very different type of coalition so he has the greens business friendly liberals and what we're going to see really is a modernizing germany which says it wants to digitalize the country and also help people uh, really get Germany moving after 16 years of what some people would say has been quite a conservative, backward-looking country. The new government says it wants to look forward and take Germany really into the future. Damien, thank you very much, Damien McGuinness in Berlin. The time is 21 minutes past one, our top story this lunchtime. Boris Johnson has apologised at Prime Minister's questions for a video that shows Number 10 staff seeming to make light of lockdown measures and says he's asked for an investigation and good things come in little packages. We meet the artist who says his autism helps his art. And coming up on Sport on the BBC News Channel, action from the Gabba where it was the same old story for England, bowled out for 147 by Australia on the opening day of the first Ashes Test in Brisbane. A mobile phone signal and access to high-speed broadband is something that most of us take for granted. But in rural areas across the UK, it's something that many can only dream of. The rise of home working and distance learning during the pandemic has put even more pressure on communities already struggling with connectivity. Our correspondent Danny Savage reports from Coverdale in North Yorkshire. In this picturesque part of Yorkshire, the quality of life is rich, but technologically, it's poor. It is a problem. We have a lot of complaints from customers. There. At this smart restaurant and wedding venue, they struggle with one modern facility nearly everyone expects. There's no mobile phone signal. Probably the biggest reaction is a walkout uh, where somebody booked a cottage for a whole weekend. Uh, they were up here, they were also doing work as well as wanting to phone the loved ones, and they just couldn't do it. So they just sort of threw the keys and, and left, unfortunately. No, nothing at all. Here, to get a mobile phone signal, Leo has to drive to the top of a nearby hill. The problem is I might be doing this four or five times a day, and especially now with the new uh, things around the banks where you have to get a text message and come out and everything, it's becoming a lot more often. And this isn't a small knot spot for phone signal. It lasts for more than 12 miles, which can take about 40 minutes driving down these country lanes. Visiting and need to make a call? Well, then you might need one of these. But things are about to change. A 5G mast will soon be switched on, giving wireless broadband to the homes scattered through this dale. How slow is the broadband here? Very slow. <laughs> Sarah tries to work from home online. A 5G signal will make a huge difference. It's infuriating. We pay the same amount as people in cities and we get an absolutely terrible service. We, we live in a beautiful place, but it's, um, it, it's, it's very difficult to work in that beautiful place with the speeds that we have. Her partner Tim will get a mobile 5G receiver so he can get coverage outside too, immediately improving farm safety. If there's a, an accident, it's, it's extra minutes, isn't it, to, to try and get emergency services here. We would have to run down home or take a vehicle down the home, uh, ring from the house, uh, and, and times, you know, times lives, isn't it? I can't enjoy what other people enjoy in life and take for granted. Sam is 22. He hopes better connectivity will see people stay and live here. It probably would influence maybe not young people, but families to move back, and that would have a knock-on effect and make their children hopefully stay in the Dale and start their own business or want to work from home like I want to do. 
after the imminent 5G switch-on, mobile phone coverage is planned to follow, bringing this ancient dale into the 21st century. Danny Savage, BBC News, Coverdale. The Prime Minister has said there will effectively be a diplomatic boycott of the Beijing Winter Olympics as no ministers are attending, but that he disagrees with sporting boycotts in principle. Boris Johnson was speaking after Australia joined the United States' diplomatic boycott of next year's Games, confirming that it will not send officials or politicians to them. China has criticised the diplomatic boycott and has threatened to retaliate. The Mercedes Formula One team's sponsorship deal with Kingspan a firm that made insulation material involved in the Grenfell Tower disaster has ended a week after it was announced. The F1 team were heavily criticised over the deal, with survivors of the June 2017 tragedy describing it as truly shocking. The Grenfell United campaign group welcomed today's news, saying it proved people can be put before profit. The artist Willard Wigan is best known for creating tiny works of art, often displayed in the eye of a needle or on the head of a pin. They're so minute that they can only be seen through a microscope. During a motivational talk for school children, Willard described his autism as a blessing and said it had inspired his success. Joanne Rittle was watching. You know, there's a saying, the best things come in small packages. Little things mean a lot. Willard Wiggins become world famous for his minuscule works of art which can sit in the head of a needle. Even the Queen has a tiny crown at Buckingham Palace. But what many people don't know is that he's autistic and it's something he spoke to children at St George's School, Edgbaston about. Scientists can't explain my work. They say, oh, this is impossible. How can a human being do this? How can a human being do that? The world needs to understand that autism hasn't been properly uncovered. They've only uncovered some of it. I was quite surprised because of what he's come from. And I have bought some tea and I was surprised that he still kept on going. He made me feel like I could do more than I think I could because so he's overcome quite a lot. And some as someone who has dyslexia, I know what it's like to face hard things. So now it made me feel like I can actually overcome problems. Willard was brought up in Wolverhampton and now lives in Birmingham. His autism wasn't diagnosed until he was 50, but his late mum, Zeta, recognised his difference and remains his inspiration to this day. One time I carved a little bird perched on the point of a toothpick. He said, it's too big. So, I, you know, then I started to say to myself, well, if I don't make it real small, my mum won't appreciate it. My mum would always say the diamond's in the dustbin meaning people would throw them into a bin and not realise what's in there until they take the lid off and realise they've thrown a diamond in there. And that's what autistic people are, they're diamonds. Techniques he uses are fascinating. He also has a photographic memory. To create this type of artwork, I have to slow down my breathing. I have to work in between my heartbeat. I have to make sure the pulse in my finger doesn't cause any problems because when you're working on this microscopic level, you have external forces that interfere with your work. I have to avoid that by working at night to avoid any traffic vibration or anything like that. It's, it's, like, it's like trying to put a pin through a bubble without bursting the bubble. Willard's work, ranging from a dragon to the boxer Tyson Fury, can be seen at Birmingham Contemporary Art Gallery. The exhibition here opened four months ago and is now on permanent display. Willard's described it as his gift to his home city. Joanne Rittle, BBC News. Cricket in England have had an abysmal start to this year's Ashes series against Australia in Brisbane. They won the toss and chose to bat but were bowled out for 147. Rory Burns became only the second player in Ashes history to be out to the first ball of the series. Joe Wilson reports. No travelling fans permitted in Australia, but if you are brave enough to support England and live in Brisbane, well, hurry to your seats. You might miss it. The Ashes start and Rory burns. Ouch. Yep, that was the first ball of the series and it sure set the tone. David Milan departed with England score 11, so England's captain was in. England rely on Joe Root hundreds. He made naught. Australia's new captain, Pat Cummins, got rid of Ben Stokes. And straight after lunch, Hasib Hamid, who had at least defied the 25. But now what's this? 
The ball suddenly flying to the boundary at Joss Butler pace. He had a partnership with Ollie Pope and in the crowd, appreciation for the neutral supporter. At least it was getting competitive for a bit. Edged and gone. There was Butler gone for 39. England were all out for just 147 after a fine catch. Another one, a wicket for Cummins, another one. His fifth, in fact. Australia's captain walked off in a perfect world from start to tee. His side had dominated. It's a dream start, really. Really proud of yeah, how consistent everyone was. Um, composed. So happy for Starkey. That's why he opens the bowling. He's just got a real knack of, of picking up a wicket in the first couple of overs. and Just a really good start. The weather ruled out the final session. England's bowlers with neither Anderson nor Broad selected must be outstanding to stop the whole match slipping away on the second day. Joe Wilson, BBC News. Not what you expect in Brisbane, is it really? Let's take, take a look at our weather forecast with uh, Louise and some people really hoping for respite from storms. We're getting there, Martin. We really are. I mean, Storm Barra is starting to weaken. Still with us, actually. Still influencing the story for the rest of the afternoon. Still some wet and windy weather. In actual fact, we've seen gusts of winds so far today, 50, 60 miles an hour across southwest England and Wales, just to the south of the centre of the low. But they will ease this afternoon as the low starts to weaken a little and slowly, surely meanders its way steadily north. You can see where the centre of the low is and circulating in an anti-clockwise direction of the these bands of shower clouds, some of them merging together this afternoon across Northern Ireland, Northwest England and Wales to bring some heavier rain for a time. Central and Southern England may see a little bit of brightness, but it's not very warm out there, is it? Six to nine degrees at the very best. Now, some of those showers actually should drift their way south and east for the first part of the night. But as the low starts to ease away, we'll have clearer skies. The showers will ease. That's going to allow temperatures to fall close to single figures. A real mess tomorrow with a little bit of patchy mist and fog, maybe some frost in sheltered areas as well. But a chilly start, but hopefully a sunny start. Few scattered showers to the far northwest. But out to the west, we'll see this cloud and rain gathering. Another weather front gradually going to push its way steadily eastwards. So central and eastern areas will keep the best of the sunshine, but still on the chilly side, six to eight degrees, cloud and rain, and maybe double digits into the southwest. That front has to move its way steadily south and east through Thursday night into Friday morning. Brisk wind then tucks in behind and once again changing back to a northwesterly. So that means that some of these showers could have a little bit of a wintry flavour, chiefly to higher ground, but it still will feel quite chilly across the far northwest. Lots of sunshine around on Friday, a quieter day, not a warmer day, five to nine degrees. But it could be a case of be careful what you wish for, because if you do want the milder weather, unfortunately, it looks likely to come at a price, as this next area of low pressure will change the wind direction to a milder southwesterly. So, yes, the temperatures are going to climb up as we go through the weekend. But unfortunately, it does mean that some of us will see some rain around as well. There you go. Back to you, Martin. Thank you very much. A reminder of our top story. Boris Johnson has apologised for a video that shows Number 10 staff seeming to make light of lockdown measures and says he's asked for an investigation. That's all from the BBC News at once. So it's goodbye from me and on BBC One. We join the BBC's news teams where you are.